Welcome back students. In the last lecture we talked about client-server architecture in general, which I think is important background to understand this lecture in which we will talk more in depth about database servers specifically. The core technology behind database servers is tried and true. They're not functionally that different than the database servers I used when I was still in high school in the early 1980s. And I worked for a local computer store writing SQL queries to provide reports for their consulting clients. What has changed, however, is the details. In the 80s, we had dozens of users connected by a local area network. Today's databases can have millions of users connected by the internet. And they are accessing gigabytes and terabytes of data rather than megabytes. So today's databases need to be very powerful to handle this massive increase in requirements. And along with that comes the cost of interruptions of server availability. So today's databases have to be very robust. And with global interconnectivity comes the dangers of very sophisticated hackers and high costs associated with security breaches. So today's databases need to be very secure. But the core functionality of sending a request to a database in the form of a SQL or a structured query language statement and getting a response has not changed much at all. In fact, I bet many of those SQL queries that I wrote in 1983 would still run today. The take-home message is that this is tried and true technology that has stood the test of time because it's very good at what it does. Now, there are certainly databases today that aren't based on SQL, and they have some advantages, but most GIS client software works with SQL databases, and we're going to focus on them for the purposes of this course. But again, don't worry, we're not going to have to write any SQL statements for this course. You should understand, however, that what is happening under the hood is that our desktop GIS is taking our mouse clicks and converting them to SQL queries. The response from a SQL query can be data, but it might also be a simple success or failure message in the case of queries that don't ask for data, but rather direct the database to do things like update a field, delete a record, create a new user account, etc. All of that and a lot more is done via SQL. In fact, pretty much everything that you can do to a modern database is done through a SQL statement. The database client may be a GUI or a graphical user interface to the database. PostgreSQL comes with one called pgadmin4 that we'll be using for this course, but there are many others and most of them work basically the same. They allow you to see all the components of the database, write SQL queries, and view the response. Now QGIS has one that's built in, and you can use it to write SQL queries against data that isn't even stored in a SQL database. You can write SQL queries against shapefiles or data in a geodatabase or other types of storage formats. A spreadsheet might also be a database client, most modern databases can connect to a spreadsheet and allow you to view a table. In this case, rather than storing the spreadsheet data in the spreadsheet file, the spreadsheet submits a request to the database when it's opened, and in this way it's always working with the most current data. And if it's really important that you have the most current data and you're not sure, you can always refresh the spreadsheet and it'll make a request to get the data from the database again. So you have the most current data because remember there can be other clients that can be connected to the database and they might be adding or changing the data while you have it open in your spreadsheet. Now many if not most web applications are database clients as well. When you open a page on CNN the news stories and pictures are read from a database. When you search for an item on Amazon.com you are searching a database and even a WordPress blog pulls its content from a database, which is why when you add a new blog post, you just submit the title and the content and things to a database rather than going in and editing the HTML manually. And WebGIS applications are no different. They pull geospatial data from a database server to display on a web map. Now if you want to learn how to do that, I have a series of courses on developing web-based GIS applications. I happen to think it's easy and fun, but there will be a lot of programming involved. On the other hand, if you learn how to do it, you can do pretty much anything that you want to do, and you don't have to spend a lot of time trying to find somebody else's solution 
and testing out to see if it works for you and many times finding out that it won't work for you and having to start from scratch. So sometimes it's good to just do it yourself. But I realize not everybody likes programming as much as I do. Mobile applications can also be a client if you want to be able to collect and or modify data in the field or just simply view the location of spatial data relative to yourself using the device's built-in GPS system. Mobile clients have a few additional complexities, however, in that they're not always connected to the Internet, and that using the Internet is not free of charge. So steps have to be taken to deal with lack of connectivity and minimizing the amount of data that gets sent back and forth between the client and the server. But mobile applications can be a powerful tool in your geospatial data toolbox. And if you are connected directly to your geospatial database, you won't have to go through the process of loading data onto a mobile device manually and then retrieving it at the end of the day and syncing it back with your database, etc. So you can save a lot of time that way. Finally, desktop software such as QGIS or Manifold or ArcMap can be clients to your geospatial database. In this case, the database serves mainly as a data store for the data being displayed and or analyzed. The desktop G GIS itself does all of the processing on the client. However, if you know Spatial SQL, there's a lot of analytical work that you can do on the server using SQL commands, and some software like QGIS will allow you to do so directly. This has the advantage of using the computer that is running the server for processing, which might provide performance gains. Again, I have a course called Introduction to Spatial Databases with PostGIS and QGIS that you can take if you want to learn more, but we won't be working with SQL directly in this course. Now, some clients have limitations. For instance, ArcMap can read data from PostGIS and use them as input for analysis or display them on map documents, but ArcGIS cannot be used to edit data in a PostGIS database to the best of my knowledge. It's possible that there may be extensions that can do it now. I don't know. Honestly, I really haven't been keeping up with ArcGIS lately. QGIS, however, is great at editing PostGIS data. In fact, that's what it was originally written to do 10 years ago. So PostGIS is embedded deep in QGIS's DNA. And QGIS is free, so there's really no reason why you couldn't use QGIS to edit your data and ArcGIS to display and analyze your data if you wanted. This hybrid approach can save your organization tens of thousands of dollars in software licensing because it's the ability to edit data on a database server that really gets expensive when you're using Esri products. There are many database servers available that have the ability to work with spatial data. Some of them are from commercial companies such as Microsoft's SQL Server, Oracle and IBM's DB2. Others are open source, such as MySQL, which is very popular for web applications, and PostgreSQL, which is very popular in the GIS world because of the availability of PostGIS, which provides spatial functionality to PostgreSQL. So how are databases used with geospatial data? Many GIS specialists have the idea that spatial data is somehow special and very complicated and requires very complicated software. And it is true that spatial functionality requires some additional capability, but it's still only data and databases can handle it very well with a little bit of help. But for now, let's put aside the concepts of geometry and focus on the attribute or tabular data associated with GIS. Normal SQL databases are organized as tables and each table can have many records, and each record can be made up of several fields. This is standard database terminology, and has been for 40 years. And this is very similar to the notion of tables, rows, and columns in a spreadsheet, although spreadsheets can be a lot more flexible than a database table. They're not contained to this rigid structure. Now, in modern GIS systems, we usually talk about feature classes, features, and attributes. And if you're coming from the object-oriented world, you may be used to thinking about classes, objects, and properties. And all of this terminology can be confusing, especially because they're frequently used interchangeably. 
sometimes in the same sentence. But it really shouldn't be. They're all referring to the same three things, more or less, at least for the purposes of this course. So tables, feature classes, and classes refer to types of things, such as dogs or oil wells. Records, rows, features, and objects refer to specific things of a certain type. For example, my dog Spot is a specific dog, and oil well number A673 is a specific oil well. Now your dog Sam is another specific dog in the dog table, so it would be another record or another feature or another object. Fields, columns, attributes, and properties refer to bits of information that describe a specific thing. Spot is a brown cocker spaniel, so the dog table might have a color and a breed field. Oil well A673 was drilled in 1993 and produces 56 barrels of oil a day. And so this is a good time to start thinking about some differences in the kind of data that we can record. For instance, 1993 will always be the year that this well was drilled, but its production probably changes over time. So the drill date is static data, but production is dynamic. And this distinction between static and dynamic data is an important concept that we will return to throughout this course. This is also a good time to point out that some types of data can have a spatial location. An oil well can have a latitude and a longitude as well. And points are easy to represent with two fields in the database to hold coordinates, but lines and polygons require more complex data structures. Our databases also have information about relationships between database tables. There can be a relationship between dogs and owners, for instance. We can have a field in the dog table that contains the owner's name, and then we can ask the database things like, get me all the dogs that are owned by Joe Smith. Relationships based on common attributes are known as attribute joins. We can also have a relationship between oil wells and counties, for instance. And it could be handled the same way, by having a field in the oil well table that contains the name of the county. That would work, but it requires storing that data in the database, which takes up space when the relationship between oil wells and counties is a spatial one. And if we have the geometry of the county and the geometry of the oil wells, we can ask questions like, what county is oil well A673 in? Or get me all the wells in Knox County without having to store the name of the county using a spatial relationship. Spatial relationships can also answer questions that could not even be formulated with only attribute data such as what percentage of Knox County is within 100 yards of an oil well. And hopefully by now you're thinking that these are questions that can be easily handled with desktop GIS software. And that's true, but they can also be handled with a database if that database has spatial capabilities. Some databases have built-in ability to work with spatial data, such as SQL Server, but others require an extension. Esri provides a commercial spatial database extension called ArcSDE, which adds spatial capabilities to SQL Server or Oracle or PostgreSQL and others in a way that Esri products can work with easily. PostGIS is an open source spatial extension for PostgreSQL that adds spatial capabilities that implement the OGC standards. That's important because OGC standards are well documented and use standard libraries for spatial operations that are well known and have stood the test of time. You know exactly what you're getting with OGC standards, and that can be important, especially with scientific analysis. But what do these spatial extensions actually do? One thing is that they provide the capability to store spatial data in the database. We already said it's easy with points just by adding fields to hold the coordinates, but lines and polygons are more complicated. So a spatial extension is necessary to store lines and polygons. And these are stored as a special type of field called a geometry field. Spatial extensions also include spatial functions that can be used in SQL queries for a lot of spatial operations. PostGIS includes over a thousand spatial functions 
that allow you to do things like transform between coordinate systems, test spatial relationships, such as is a point in a polygon, perform spatial operations such as buffering a line, or return the intersection of two polygons, and perform spatial calculations such as measuring the area or distance between two polygons. In fact, you can do almost anything in a spatial database that you can do with desktop GIS using Spatial SQL. Sometimes it's way easier, sometimes it's not quite as straightforward, but it's good to have options. Doing analysis using Spatial SQL also means that you're using the computer that is hosting the server to perform the analysis rather than the computer that the client is running on, which can provide performance advantages. Now again, we won't be writing Spatial SQL queries in this course, but you should know that it's available and can be advantageous. So hopefully by now you are starting to get the picture that we have these databases, which are amazing pieces of software with many advantages over file-based data storage. And we're adding spatial capabilities to those databases. And hopefully you're thinking, well, if we can do that, why would we ever want to store data in a file? And my answer would be, probably you shouldn't unless it's just temporarily until you can get it into a database. In the next lecture, I will talk a bit more about why traditional file-based architecture has trouble dealing with multiple users and how client-server architecture solves those problems. And we'll see you then.